Hello, good day everyone. Welcome to Critical Faculty. Um, it's probably the conversation you've been waiting for. Um, uh, about a week ago, um, a famous um, debate is taking place. Uh, I was looking forward to it for quite some time to put an, an end to this ridiculous uh, raids by um, a, a specific doctor um, whose content is mostly on YouTube and not in published papers. And I've got the person who actually did, uh, in my opinion, a fantastic job, not beating around the bush, uh, exposing him for uh, what I think for the fraud he is. Um, hello, Dave, how are you? Good, how are you doing? Very good, very good. Thank you so much for coming to C Critical Faculty one more time. Um, today we are going to be discussing the debate. First, maybe we'll start with the scientific aspects and we're going to get into the, um, the, the, the scenes, the surrounding the, the debate, the audience, the, the moderator <clears throat> with, his, um, um, with his wig. <laughs> I was very distracted by his wig. <laughs> um, um, and then we're going to talk about the, um, your, your experience with, with James Tour. But you've been looking forward to this for quite some time. It's been a couple of years in the making, I guess. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, he issued the debate challenge some time ago, I think something like two years ago. Um, I didn't take it seriously because he was just kind of grandstanding. And I think he issued that before I even uh, before I even issued my response to his series. So he didn't really know what I was what I had conjured up there. Uh, so that just kind of simmered. But then when he came back more recently and made this next series that was really aggressively attacking me and slandering me and just cartoons of Dave and just all this, I was like, yeah, we're not doing this. So remember the debate thing? Yeah, that's going to happen now. And I'm going to humiliate you. So, uh, it was uh, just as with everything always on his end, always pushing and triggering and uh, making this happen. So that's why. Yeah. Um, the, the debate was, was quite interesting for me because it was a home ground. That's Rice University. This is where he teaches. Apparently, the actual venue yeah. is in his own classroom. So he's a, on home turf. He's got his students, uh, probably the Christian group. Um, and you, you can feel he was feeling at home. Uh, he started the conversation by saying, I'm not uh, an experienced debater. Um, uh, just, yeah. you know, uh, he doesn't know what he's, uh, he's waiting for here. And, and then um, uh, the, the board, the, the, uh, using the choke and, 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 and almost like being in a, in, a, in a classroom, that was a very bizarre move by him. Yeah, a bizarre move, honestly, not a bad move strategically from him for, for him, because it's the only thing that gave him the illusion of, of, of having mm -hmm. any kind of upper hand to his, to not his students, to, to his church group, his church group fell for it. Um, yeah, <laughs> so uh, a good strategy on his part because he had nothing. So that was really all he had. But uh, nevertheless, to anyone with any kind of ability for critical thinking, they could see through the pageantry of, uh, of, of what he was doing. Well, I think you rebutted his um, allegations quite nicely because you, you, you've eventually wrote it on the blackboard. So it must be true. And the audience yeah. uh, loved it then. <laughs> Sure. I mean, there's really the only words I ever uh, needed to write with Chuck. <laughs> yeah, that's no all we clue. needed. <laughs> that was classic. Um, so he started with, um, we'll get a, bit, a little bit into the signs, uh, and the problem with the biogenesis. Um, he called it the, the time of the gap, or the, the gap of time, or some some stupid twist about God of the gaps. He's, and he's, he's saying, oh, well, it's because we weren't there. Um, as if he's doing science for the first time. We can't really tell. He, and if you think as a, as a proper scientist, we do that all the time. Go back yeah. and do inferences and come up with, uh, with all sort of... Um, let, let, me, let me just... I, I rarely steel man anything that James says, but here's an opportunity to steel man. I think what he meant by time of the gaps is that there could be someone who's not well-versed in the sciences that would say, well, given millions of years, anything could happen. Right. 
I think that's what's meant by the time of the gaps uh, argument, or it's not really an argument. In fact, nobody really says that. But um, sure, if someone was to say, oh, given a long enough time, you'll get life, that doesn't really adequately address the question of how abiogenesis could have occurred. Nevertheless, it is true. Uh, when you have millions of years, a lot of different things can happen. So it's not really a totally nonsensical thing to say. Whereas God of the Gaps, I mean, everybody knows what God of the Gaps is. And everybody knows that James believes in the God of the Gaps, even though he will he refuses to explicitly say so. Uh, but by definition, that is his God. That is, we know, he, that's what he believes. So, Do you think the whole premise is predicated on a classic uh, argument from ignorance? Uh, I don't know, therefore... Well, yes, but I mean, that, that's what he's ideologically bound to believing, right? Mm -hmm. He Scripture tells him that God created life, so that's what he believes. And it's Scripture over science for him, ironically, because he's a scientist. Uh, so that's what he's ide ideologically bound to believing. Then he plays this semantic game with his viewers and in his own mind, I imagine, uh, to try to undercut, the, you know, to try to neutralize any science that runs contrary to his religious beliefs. So the kind of science he does in his lab, it's not a problem. He makes graphene and uh, nanocars, and th th this has nothing to do with God or anything like that. But anything about origin of life, anything about evolution, I mean, he's outspoken about evolution too, but he doesn't talk about it as much because he's completely clueless about biology as it mm. turns out he's clueless about origin of life research as well but he's able to fake it because he can use the chemistry vernacular uh, and and trick people into thinking he knows what he's talking about well he seems to be clueless about lots of things he's you've mentioned the situation where uh you know when you when you do the washing of basaltic rock with pure water and yep. uh, oxygen peroxide to 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 to, for any contamination, and and he did not know that basalt rock contained uh, was it um, magnesium? Um, uh, magnesium, yes. Rich in magnesium. Rich so in it's, magnesium. It's, it's actually twofold. The error is twofold, and this is in his content where he's slandering Stephen Benner, telling him his research is stupid. So by criticizing the washings, and I highlighted this in my opening statement for a very specific reason. When he appears to be very diligent or he presents himself as diligent in going into the supplemental materials and looking at the specific methodology. He's actually just clueless. He's showing how clueless he is. So he says, oh, Benner, you washed all the magnesium off the basalt that would interfere with the, with the processes you're trying to get. Uh, and uh, it's like, no, this there's magnesium in the thing, <laughs> in the basaltic surface, there's magnesium. And then secondly, he's all this is his other thing is to complain that uh, human intervention makes things not prebiotic. But mm -hmm. the problem is the current earth is not prebiotic. There's life everywhere. So sure. by using hydrogen peroxide and washing with ultra pure water, you're getting rid of bacteria and other biological contaminants to make it more prebiotic. You know, the same with like running a reaction under argon. Oh, what well, you know, you ran it under argon. It's like, yeah, because there's oxygen here now. That wasn't there then. That's why. So every time he tries to talk about methodology, making it not prebiotic, he's just demonstrating that he has no idea what he's talking about. And I think potentially not even lying, but just genuinely not understanding uh, the research. So oh, that, that was going to be my next question, because I, 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 I can't. I mean, if he was like that, because I was going to uh, probe is a competency or is he playing to an ignorant audience who are not interested in science, but interested in yeah. proving their gods? It's um, both. Yeah, it's both. I mean, he's definitely actively lying about research, but I think he also at times genuinely does not understand uh, the research that he's referencing. Right. The, the uh, physics, chemistry, biochemistry, biology. I mean, that's usually the sequence. Uh, and for, for a chemist, he does not seem to understand, like he talked about autocatalysis and, and the word itself contain the meaning that it, it does that itself. It's self-sustained. Yeah. It, it does not need an Prefix, outside factor. Auto itself. Yeah. But why doesn't he understand that? That's like, it's in the words. He doesn't want to. And I mean, I told him about it, but it's, I mean, the thing with autocatalysis, so uh, he like... <laughs> the thing is that systems chemistry is so central to origin of life research. And it's once you start looking at systems chemistry and you start to learn about how systems of molecules can exhibit Darwinian principles. So there is actual evolution going on on the molecular level prior to the emergence of any living system. This is just so it's ju it just becomes so obviously elucidating how life can have emerged. 
from sets of molecules. It's just too hot for him to, to discuss. So he just pretends it doesn't exist. He's made two series now one was like 10 hours the other one was like eight hours this is like 10 between 10 and 20 hours of content as here's how to learn about origin of life research and he never brings up systems chemistry a single time mm -hmm. i mean this is like are you kidding me this is like the most important thing that you should be talking about the whole time you know so it's there's no better demonstration of his is the bad faith nature of his approach to the topic and, and he brings within the conversation, within the first 10 minutes intro, the classic Behe argument, the irreducible complexity. He calls it something slightly different. but it's, He talked uh, about it's, specified information. Specified information. So that's, that's maybe, Dembski. Um, that's Dembski. Dembski, not Dembski yeah. yeah, I'm going uh, yeah. to debunk that later at some point. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, um, but when, when it comes to the complexity situation, like, uh, Polymers aren't, correct me if I'm wrong, aren't polymers um, is a group of monomers put together to create that polymer, the complex, complex sequence. So everything that looks complex had an initial, uh, initial humble beginning of even simpler form. Why does he come to the very last scene? So, oh, that's too complex. How did it emerge? Well, it, it, this is classic Discovery Institute playbook. I mean, this is what creationists say, right? There's a code they, they need. So the same, it's the same with irreducible complexity. So B he says, look, this looks like a machine and machines have creators. So life has a creator. Same thing here. This looks like a code and codes have creators. So this has a creator. It's all this is all sleight of hand stuff. So they're talking about they, they try to make up this terminology to imply that that what the, the information in nucleic acids is just too crazy. It just couldn't have. It's like, look, this the information is the sequence of nucleotides, right? If, if nucleotides are going to polymerize, you're going to get a sequence. And that's the information. Now. The trick is by chance for certain sequences to arise that produce uh, ribozymes with certain activity such that they do some interesting, you know, they do some interesting catalysis. So, yeah, there are many, many, many sequences possible. And then of those potential sequences, certain ones will have interesting properties, catalytic activity, autocatalytic activity, or they do something else. They make us a short peptide. They make a tripeptide or something. So. That's interesting, but that's where, you know, just given astronomical chances, even things with infinitesimal odds are sure to occur, are sure to occur. So if you have trillions and trillions of opportunities of these nucleotides polymerizing and making all these different sequences, you're going to get some interesting ones that do something cool. You know what I mean? And, it, and, and the problem is that anytime you have something like that, if you have an enzyme or you have whatever it is, they will say, look, see, it's one in 10 to the blah, 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 big scary number to get that sequence. But that's not the only sequence that will perform that function, right? There's a lot of, there's a tremendous amount of variability in that sequence, right? It's not that every single uh, residue has to be exactly that. If you're talking about a protein now, let's say we're talking about amino acids, right? Each amino acid residue has a tremendous amount of variability. It's not like it, each one has to be exactly that one. So that's something that they never talk about. But anyway, this, the, the whole, it's, it's, the whole thing is, is just, uh, is just pseudoscience, the, so the, that, the specified information thing. Dimisky is a called specified complexity. I, I, can't, I can't remember the exact term. Yes. But he yeah. was the computer scientist who came up with a number, obviously that to the power, they give you a crazy number to tell you the likelihood of this is happening. It's, it's, it's gotta be a miracle. But then yeah. that, that's all they do. Point. Big number, little big, scary number, but it doesn't yeah. actually mean anything. You'll yeah. see it in the fine tuning and the cosmological argument. You see the exact same thing, but isn't yeah. that a, a, a teleological argument? which is the, the situation's reversed. Wouldn't be nature just acting the way it is based on initial conditions and laws of, log of, of physics and, and chemistry. And then the whole, that whole emergence gets befitted into a certain reality and either it stays alive because it can, or it dies off like the rest of the 99.99% yes. of population yeah. that couldn't. Correct. And that's why systems chemistry is so important, because when we're looking at sets of molecules that can self-replicate, obviously you're introducing a situation where interesting sequences are going to perpetuate it. This is just statistical dynamics, right? Things that are able to more efficiently self-replicate will pr will proliferate. They will predominate in nature. And so that's why it's so incredible that we've already in the past 20 years begun demonstrating these principles in sets of molecules, because this is a key feature of biological life 
in the absence of, of biological life, right? We're saying that chemistry exhibits these principles. And this is, the, you, you can't argue this. This has been empirically demonstrated. Gerald Joyce was the first and then others since then. It's a thriving field uh, that showing these principles on the chemical level. Another um, straw man, or I'm not sure it's, it must be deliberate by now, but we, we see it quite a lot, <laughs> is, is the um, the presumption of the current complexity. So it happens with, with cosmology as well. They look at the current situation. It happened in biology and evolution. Say, so look at the diversity of all the creatures. This cannot be a coincidence. This is this is too complex. Even Immanuel Kant said, you'll never get an Isaac Newton for a, a blade of grass. Um, but by reversing and going and rewinding back, things do tend to take uh, uh, simpler forms. The Mrs. Grin, the seven characteristics of, of a living being, did they have to be all in existence at the beginning? Or life could have been a lot more simpler. You don't, have, you don't need the seven characteristics of a, a living organism. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's insanely simpler. Uh, I mean, the very basic criteria of like self-replication uh, and, and and metabolism and things like that. Yeah, I believe that those are had to be in place. But the problem was with somebody like James. And so this is something where he's clearly reacted to my criticisms, because in his early content, he would show features of modern eukaryotic cells, not even prokaryotic, modern eukaryotic cells and like transcription and translation and all. Wow, look at the crazy stuff. You think this just floated to get No, nobody thinks that. This is the product of 4 billion years of evolution. And even um and then he uh, re he reacted to that and started showing uh modern bacteria. And it's like, dude, I know that prokaryotes are are simpler than eukaryotes, but this is still the product of 4 billion years of evolution. The first cell did not look anything remotely like a modern bacterium. So you have to keep going back and stripping all these things away, but then nevertheless, the, the, it's still a game where they try to pretend that they'll take a modern bacterium and and take things away and go, how simple can it get? And it's, you're still missing the point. And so he finally has reacted to that because in all of my criticisms, I, he shows like, here are all the genes you need. Here are all the DNA. Coded. No, no DNA, zero DNA. The first mm -hmm. living organism had zero DNA, or according mm -hmm. to the RNA world model and other models, at least. I mean, this is I'm just saying that this is what OOL researchers are, 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 present, are proposing, that there mm -hmm. was no DNA. So Finally, he at least in the debate was didn't pretend that you needed DNA because he knew I was going to hammer him if he said that. So now he's finally talking about RNA like, you know, like an actual discussion. But this is what he does in his content. And the people don't know what's going on. They don't know what are, you know, the church people don't know what RNA is, DNA, what the difference is. But um, that's what all of his content has been like. And so, you know, I think he tried his best to strip away a lot of those straw men. To, so that I wouldn't have as many opportunities to hammer him. But um, yeah, I mean, he's still <laughs> still very, very, he presented it in that way of stripping away features of, of, of like a modern bacterium. And that's just not it. That's just not mm -hmm. what anyone is proposing in the field. It's cleverly used in the debate. Um, uh, I, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not, not sure if it's gullible or overly ambitious um, statements by like, you know, the likes of Shostak and Lee Cronin. Um, and, and maybe Venner at some point that life is going to be, we, we're going to have life prepared in the lab in the next couple of years. Yeah. Uh, do you think maybe people should stop saying that and, 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 and don't overcommit? Yeah, well, the thing is, when he does that, he's quote mining anyway. Like the Jack Shostak quote, that was a quote mine. Like, like what Shostak was saying was he was talking about proto cell assembly given the constituent parts, and he's not he's not necessarily one of the chemists that's 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 working on uh, on on the prebiotic synthesis to the to the building blocks. So he he definitely took that out of context. I'm I'm doing a follow up video, and I'm going to show all the all the quote mines and all the misquoting and everything. Um, with Lee Cronin, I mean, uh, see, the, 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 thing, the, the problem here is the conflation of the creation of artificial life with, uh, with determining the ancient pathways to, to the first protocell. They're not really the same. Uh, there's obviously overlap of the fields, but synthetic biology is not origin of life research. They're not identical, right? And so, I mean, honestly, Lee Cronin is, is a little bit more fixated on, on the creation of artificial life. And so he's considered an origin of life researcher. I mean, he does work, you know, in that field at, at least tangentially, but he's not doing what necessarily some of the people who, who are, who are 
actively trying to find what these prebiotic pathways were to give the first life. They're not the same field, right? So mm -hmm. anyway, even if somebody says, oh, I'm going to get life and then they didn't get it, it just kind of doesn't really have that much to do with this the study of, of what happened prebiotically. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Who came up with the uh, debate title? So I did. Uh, <laughs> so James oh, won. Very well, <laughs> yeah, J he wanted to, by the way, it took a month of back and forth by email to get this thing going because he, he was just being slippery as a snake. But uh, he he wanted it to be does science explain the origin of life or does chemistry explain the origin of life, knowing full well that no, it doesn't immaculately perfectly explain. We don't know. I'm mean, nobody says that we know exactly what happened. We certainly don't, partially because for each step of the pathway, we have too many options that are viable. So it's that's what makes it hard to know exactly. It's like, how did amino acids come about? Well, some came from space, some came from Strucker synthesis, some came. So we don't know. <laughs> we'll probably never know exactly what happened. But um, anyway, I pushed back on that because I was like, look, your mantra is this. You go on the Internet all over the place. Go, we're clueless. Scientists are clueless. We're clueless. Clueless, 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 clueless. So that's the title of the debate. If you don't like it, it's because you know that the position is indefensible and you're going to get embarrassed. So he accepted it, but then he immediately tried to re redefine <laughs> the the meaning yeah. or just well, recontextualize it's a clever one because, because you want it from the word go because we know oh, yeah. since the uh, Miller Urey experiment there are so many leaps about uh, understanding how things would have emerged. Still, some questions persist, but uh, yeah. to compare us to. By the way, a very young science, and I'm not sure why people are so impatient. It's only it's only been probably the last 20, 30 years of the, the serious stuff of it was really happening. So it's yeah. a very young science. And I, I bet you, once we get to know uh, the origin of life, um, uh, the goalpost is going to be shifted one more time. Say, so, well, you know what? God uh, made it that way. That's how my God created <laughs> Well, if you want to, that's how my God created the universe with these uh, laws in place such that life can emerge. But the thing, the problem, I mean, the, not the problem, but the thing is that I don't, that doesn't bother me, right? Because yeah. cosmology, cosmology doesn't have even as many answers as, as, as origin of life research in terms sure. of the nuts and bolts of it. I mean, cosmology, uh, you know, past time, 10 to the negative 36 seconds or 10 to the, I forget the exact increment past a certain time has increasingly better and better information and better, better models to Pits describe. The the, yeah. That's a, yeah. It was on, yeah. Yeah. But at T equals zero, I don't know, yeah. man, <laughs> if you want to say it's God that went like that, I don't care. It doesn't bother me. It's not as the current time specifically unscientific, or at least it doesn't contradict science, I should say. Whereas sure. God going, mm, let me put some molecules to get, that's just ridiculous. That just, it's, 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 it has nothing to do with science at all, you know? Yeah. And so. it's an un unfalsified premise. It's something that you can never falsify. So yeah. it's going to have to be a matter of belief and you just leave it alone and you just do your science. And sure. And build tech. And, and guess what? It, I don't, if somebody, if religious people want to have that belief privately in their homes and in their minds, I'm not going to knock down your front door and shove systems chemistry research in your face. I don't yeah. care. It, James is the one that is a toxic influence that is spreading lies and misinformation. It's not that he's going on in there and saying, I believe in God and the scripture, and therefore I believe that uh, God created life and end of story. No, he's slandering researchers in the field and lying all over the Internet. This is a this is a very toxic and negative influence on society that promotes science denial. And it has a trickle down effect where people go, oh, they're lying about the, the origin of life. Research scientists are lying about that and they're lying about the vaccines and they're lying about climate. They're lying. It's that's how science deniers think. Right. It's all it's all connected. So it has a very tangible negative ramification on society that needs to be neutralized. So that's why I do it. Now, let's explain to people a little bit to the audience about the scientific method and how do you um, uh, debunk or uh, protest or contest scientific ideas? Because my understanding is uh, science papers need to be published, they get peer reviewed, and eventually they, they're verified and you get scientific consensus. You don't go on YouTube um, and, or tabloids along with the Kardashians in the next uh, article uh, to, to write in a, in a blog post um, uh, your, your uh, position on, on things. But it seems that James Stewart never really published anything viable to that effect. 
well, no, not in this topic, uh, and which is rendered all the more embarrassing due to the fact that he is a scientist and he understands how to publish literature. In fact, he brags about his big number of publications, uh, largely due to the incredible number of uh, graduate students he has. <laughs> but um, so he knows how to publish papers. Right. And so and and he knows that uh, if he had valid criticisms, he could publish these. Uh, in fact, um, uh, my favorite question during the Q&A was someone grilling him as to why he does not go through the proper channels and publish his critiques in peer reviewed journals. And what was the funniest? I mean, I knew what his response was going to be because he's given this response before uh, that he's not going to engage with the scientists. He's going to go straight to the public, which is very telling in and of itself. But in his response, he specifically said, it's very hard for me to to publish anything that's critical of the field. Others have done it. Bob Shapiro has done it, et cetera. He listed people who have published critiques. So it's like, why can't you, buddy? Right. If Shapiro can do it, why can't you? Either his his critiques are legitimate and yours aren't or there's some kind of conspiracy against the Jesus people or something like that. Right. He really shot himself in the foot by listing people who have indeed. And Shapiro's critiques were taken. I mean, they're a couple of decades old at this point. I mean, I think this was the 90s, actually. So it was it was before literally the entire field of systems chemistry. It was before most of what we know now about the, the, the you know, the, the main pathways. So it's a little bit archaic at this point, but it was taken seriously by the field. It was like, OK, we need to figure out how to get beyond relay synthesis. We need to figure out like it, it was uh, it was an accurate criticism of the status of the field at the time. That's not what James does. He lies about it. That's very, very different. That's why he cannot publish his critiques because they're full of lies. And that's why he pushes them on the public instead, because they don't know what he's talking about. That's all there is to it. What, one of the things about science is if you are going to have a competing hypothesis, you, you, you got to provide uh, a well-established uh, research. So, for example, you might say the RNA world would explain away um, that the simplicity was needed before the complications of a DNA. Uh, or you can have a panspermia uh, and you explain it with, with data and information. And you can explain that the building blocks are in abundance and in space and stuff like that. But things like your biogenesis in, in the ID uh, movement, and why, that's why they're called pseudoscience, is they don't give you a model. All what they're trying to say is whatever you're saying, too difficult to happen. It, the numbers are not stacking up. Yeah. How is that? A, that's not science. That That's fine. No, no, it's not science. Um, it's it's objectively not science. Uh, but the but the thing is that e even e even if James doesn't have a model, he doesn't have to have a model. Right? It's OK to publish a critique without offering an alternate solution and others have done this and you can do this in in the in the literature but it's just that his critiques are not valid right that's the point right when he's crit criticizing something he's either lying about it or he's just not understanding what they're doing so that's why you know oh you washed it or you'd use the argon or you're doing things yeah buddy these are mimicking geochemical cycles or these are specifically trying to recreate uh, natural cycles or things, right? This is testing something prebiotic and he's just not comprehending. So that's why he can never publish any of this stuff because anybody who works in the field would read anything he says and go, this guy is a clown. He doesn't even know the first thing about what we do. I mean, he really genuinely doesn't. Like he likes to pretend that being a synthetic chemist is all you need to understand this field. It's not, right? J synthetic chemists are not primed to look at something like systems chemistry and have any idea of what's going on in there, right? It's just not, it's not related to traditional synthetic chemistry. Yeah. Considering we're trying to repli replicate initial natural conditions. And uh, on that, he came up with that cartoonish uh, about the primordial soup being yeah, yeah. hit by lightning and you have a, a slithering creature crawling slithering out. Creature. Yeah. And so I wanted to make I, like I, I really wanted to uh, like because I knew that most of what we were going to be talking about was going to be so esoteric that it's just going over everybody's heads and they'll just, oh, James is right because I like him better. So I really wanted to make it a point. And some people are like, oh, ad hominem, ad hominem. No, the guy's a liar. Everything he says about this topic is a lie. I'm going to nail him on some lies where you don't really need to understand science. Just he said this and it ain't true. 
So that's why I nailed him on this thing that he says all the time in all of his videos. Primordial soup is the mo molecules and then lightning and then a slithering creature. And it's in all the textbooks. It's in the college. And the and this is what we teach graduates. In. It's bananas. It is not true. That's not what textbooks say. So I showed the quote. I showed what textbooks actually say, and then I railed them on it. And you, said, you can't show this. You don't have a picture of it showing this. It doesn't show this. And he just started getting really angry and ran to the board and wrote clueless and just went onto his pageantry because he cannot admit that he lied. He just can't do it. But he's there in the moment, and that's where he got really agitated because it, it started like to it. come. And, and, and then suddenly the, the voices started to be raised and raised, covering your mm -hmm. own voice and covering mm -hmm. everybody else's voice. Mm -hmm. He acted like insane at some point. I yes. That, yeah. That's insane. That's like the, the Holy Ghost is speaking through him. <laughs> It's this is what happens when you press a narcissist on this stuff, right? He he has to maintain this this facade for his viewers and for himself. I think there's a lot of turmoil going on in there. And so when you show someone how clearly wrong they are and they refuse to react to that information and adjust and change. I mean, everybody uses the term cognitive dissonance, and I think it gets overused and, and used incorrectly. But here, this is I'm using this correctly. He's experiencing cognitive dissonance because he understands science, but he's denying science that challenges his faith. And it's just that's where the rage comes from. I mean, it's very clear. And we always get with that sort of attitude, that element of uh, conspiracy. You know, mm -hmm. uh, the world is trying to suppress the existence of God, the uh, cosmologists and, and all these famous people and all these very important people that change the lives of many. And, and tech is being created on the back of these findings. You know, we're talking about things that we actually use um, on day to day basis. Uh, yet he's convinced and the likes of him will be convinced that there is some sort of a hierarchy up there, a scientific one that he's working so hard in the back ground trying to suppress the existence of god what yeah. is that or or to or to uh to to ban religious people from certain inner circles or things like that um i mean why is that why is that i mean it's as uh, because he has to say something right he has to conclude something why can't he publish this stuff you know why isn't he in the national academy of sciences well because you take a big dump all over the work of people in there Right. Gerald Joyce, Donna Blackman, Jack Shostak, they're in there and you slander them. Why would they invite you to join their ranks? Right. That's nothing to do with you being religious. I'm sure there's religious people in there, but yeah. religious scientists that are successful or, you know, a good religious scientist is able to separate those realms. He pretends to, but he does not. He certainly does not. Yeah. Like for, oh, I guess Francis Collins, the director of the Genome Project, mm -hmm. then the guy yeah. who, um, uh, was having a walk and um, saw a, a, a waterfall frozen in three sections. So he uh, went on his knees and accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Imagine if it was frozen into two. Would he accepted the uh, the Persian god, the, the dualistic? The, uh, <laughs> a binary god or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is, it's incredible. But what he did quite successfully is once he was inside the lab, he did science. Yeah. You know, and we respect him for that. We respect that person for that sort of thing. Yeah. But he can never do that. There are certain people who would always that sort of dogma will interfere with their scientific right. integrity. And it and to be fair, it does not in, it does not interfere with James's research because it doesn't have anything to do with it. And if James was not constantly going on these tirades, these very public anti science tirades. Nobody would care. I wouldn't care. I wouldn't care if there's this Christian scientist who mm -hmm. does material science but also believes God created life. I don't sure. care. It's a personal belief. It's just being that toxic influence that is poisoning the minds of the public. Someone has to intervene, and no one was doing it for this guy. Nobody. So I took it upon myself. Yeah. Um, but... Um, yeah, so it's 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 purely that you you can have your faith and it and e it can even be unscientific. I mean, faith generally is unscientific, but it it it's not. It's just about this the the public thing. You're you're poisoning people's minds, and it has to has to be neutralized. 
Well, his relationship to the Discovery Institute, I mean, in the beginning of the 21st century, they were quite active. You know, they have the Behe, the Dembski, uh, the, mm -hmm. the Meyer, you know, all these people and started to fade away. And, you know, they lost many trials. Um, uh, in Google search now, you Google, it's the term is there. It's a pseudoscience. So yet they're kind of, they faded away, but it looks like James Tour is the only viable uh, uh, scientist that they can have on board and became their cover boy. Yes. Yeah. He is the only working, actively publishing scientist they have. They have people with doctorates, but, you know, they, I, I mean, uh, you know, most of them, like if they have a doctorate, never published any research, they just got the doctorate to appear more credible for their apologetics. Uh, somebody like Behe published a couple of papers, but ultimately shifted over to, to books full of lies. Uh, so yeah, there, there. It's a bunch of clowns over there. So James is their, their, their shining knight. Uh, so for him to be humiliated by a YouTuber, it's not, it's not a very good look for him. And that's why the damage control over there is uh, through the roof. So, so uh, as you know, my half of my background is a, is a, is of a Muslim background, and and, and this is a funny story now because James Tour uh, is is going to be subtitled. Uh, and, you know, they take all his work as a proof for the existence of God. Uh, very, very bad translation of what he's saying. So we're talking about uh, a misrepresentation of a misrepresentation. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's really, really far from what he's actually saying. Um, uh, and then this is going to be popularized as, uh, here we go, you know, uh, 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 an atheist has been debunked. So I'm going to be making very sure that I'll have my Arabic conversations on that to take, to to represent your position um, quite properly, uh, because the Very Muslim good. world has is, is been has been waiting for this, and uh, we have a clubhouse debate coming very soon in Arabic, and there'll be some Arabic conversation with PhD um, uh, uh, biologist in in Germany, an, an Egyptian guy that I know he loved your conversation, and we're gonna actually open a conversation in Arabic, trying to explain your position and okay. why the other position is not scientific. Mm -hmm. it, it is very important. Um, so w w now let's go about, uh, we, we've covered a little bit of the science, let's talk about the, the actual atmosphere. Uh, before the, the debate started, how were you treated? What was the atmosphere like? It was fine. I mean, uh, the people running it were professional and, and, and just strictly concerned with putting on a good production. Um, right. Yeah, I don't know. I didn't interact with James much either, but I mean, obviously, given the what he tries, the way he tries to present himself, he wasn't like rude to me or anything. Like he, you know, struggled right. through. He, you know, tried to get some small talk going for ten minutes or so, and I was happy to humor him with that. It's not like I'm gonna like, no, you suck. Like, whatever. Like, <laughs> we're here. Yeah. Might as well talk about our kids or whatever. Uh, so no, it's not like, no, I wasn't mistreated in any way at all, uh, except for during the debate, <laughs> yeah. but, um, no, no complaints, no, no complaints really. I mean, other than that, like it was, I mean, in terms of how the debate was structured itself, it was definitely skewed in his favor. He definitely reserved a bunch of seats for his church people. He had the right. moderator in his pocket. He had his mic turned up louder than mine. Like, Nice. definitely trying to stack it as much as he could, but he can't like mute me. So, you know, I got to talk. So I thought the moderator was, was almost non-existent. There were so many times where he should have intervened just to get clarity of voices and say how we, yeah. we're, we're, we can't hear you guys. I don't care that he, uh, it, I didn't need anyone to intervene. I knew what was going to happen. I knew it was going to devolve that way because I'm very aggressively exposing him and he's a shouter. Um, so I knew that that was going to happen and I didn't need anyone to intervene, which is why I didn't care who the moderator was. But what bothered me was when he did choose to intervene, he tried to correct me three times and each time he was wrong, like not trivially wrong. Like, are you serious wrong? Like, why did you just open your mouth to say that? Uh, and then the, the, and, uh, so it was to get like, he was definitely primed on that and kind of asked to do that as much as possible. Uh, and, and that was to give the illusion of me being corrected. And then each time when I corrected him, it elicited a, a gasp from the audience of, Oh, Dave is pushing back against the moderator. How dare he? It's like, well, did you hear the dumb thing he just said? I don't like, what do you want? What he said is ridiculous and I'm going to correct him. So. 
So most of the audiences were chemistry students? Uh, I don't know. Well, I mean, there was a big like church faction, uh, and then there were a lot of students, I imagine primarily, si primarily science students. Uh, and definitely after the debate, there was a long line of people who wanted to talk to me, and a lot of people said, you know, you helped me through this class, that class, et cetera. Uh, so definitely, yeah, no, a lot of science students. Um, yeah, it's hard to say. It's hard to say exactly what the breakdown was. Yeah, because so a lot of the questions were really challenging to him. And it came from like, yeah. very smart students. I think they knew their chemistry. Yes. And the, the questions were quite good. I thought. Yes. Yeah, that was great because, you know, despite the boos and the pushback, um, none of those people have the capacity to formulate a coherent question. So when it came to the Q and a, it was primarily smart people challenging James on his uh, script. Yeah. So. There was one religious dude who made no sense whatsoever. Uh, he was, uh, you know, uh, wanted to, to suck up to, to, to James tour, but then he ended up saying, well, I, I would like you to, to debunk, uh, Farina's cosmology and even James says, oh, I don't do cosmology it was the <laughs> only moment we were in this on the same page of going what is this idiot talking about <laughs> and I, I cracked the code though I figured out what he meant is that he is bothered by the fact that I have put out numerous uh, electric universe debunks and uh, that's his little thing that he likes so that's why he was mad at me um, so w when it comes to faith I mean this is going to be a, a big dilemma well you and I are not concerned with what, what people believe in their homes. We, we, I think we're concerned with the truth. We yeah. want to, our convictions and our understanding of the world around us to be as close as possible to what's real so we can help ourselves. We've got lots of challenges coming our way, problems coming to this on this planet. And if we are delusional about how we are going to be handling ourselves in the future, we could self-annihilate. So we have a pragmatic stance on, I want to make sure that my understanding of the world around me is consistent with the reality. Then comes people who don't just want to believe in what they want to believe in their homes, but they want to apply that to the scientific method and they want to reshape reality to suit their, uh, their narrative. What do, I mean, this is dangerous. This could be potentially quite dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're telling me, uh, yeah. I, I mean, it's, um, the infiltration of science, the infiltration of politics. I mean, th what we're essentially talking about is uh, Christian nationalism trying to erode the separation of church and state. So where does that happen? I mean, that happens on every on every in every aspect of society. So, you know, what the Discovery Institute tries to do is say, hey, like um, intelligent design is also science. Maybe that should be in public schools. Right. It's like, no, it's religion. Uh, so you're trying to erode church and state. Uh, this is this is this is federal funded education. You want religion in it. That's an erosion of church and state. But um, they try to pretend that that's that that's all there is, that it's a scientific endeavor. But, you know, the the wedge document leaked very long time ago, 20 years ago, or whatever it is, it shows very clearly the intent of the organization, right, to, for for design theory to permeate uh, all aspects of social and political life, uh, right? So we're talking about theocracy, the wealth, the wealthy funders want theocracy, that's what they want, they want the handmaid's tale, right? That's, <laughs> that's what they want. Uh, so there has to be pushback here. There has to be pushback on, on every level, right? There has to be a zero tolerance policy on this. So no, intelligent design in public schools, no, sorry. Religion does not belong in public schools, period. Unless you're learning about it in an academic way. Um, because this is very intimately linked with all the rollbacks on women's rights and, uh, you know, banning abortion and, and, and you know, South Carolina started trying to get uh, mm -hmm. legislation passed to make abortion punishable by death. So it's just like, this is very dark <laughs> stuff. No, that's punishable by, death. punishable by death, death penalty for getting an abortion. And in some cases, people are trying to do the same thing for miscarriages if it can be shown that there was intent. Right. So, first of all, how are you going to prove that? Second of all, do they have any idea how common miscarriages are? My wife had five miscarriages for us to get two kids. They happen all the time. Yeah. So this is this is just uh, th this is just uh, setting up ways to jail subversive individuals. Uh, essentially, right? If you want to get a theocracy in place, you need to be able to jail anyone who is subversive to what's to to the powers that be. So we need all these little ways to be able to put people in jail by saying, ah, you did this, you did that. And, you know, this is how we get biblical law as federal law. 
And uh, so it's very dark stuff. I mean, it's like, look, I, I'm not pretending like, oh, this is around the corner tomorrow and it's definitely going to happen. Like it's it, if it happens, I doubt it will happen. But if it does, it will take decades. But this is the path. This is this is there are people who are actively trying to promote this and it needs to be fought uh, tooth and nail. Because um, I live in Australia and we don't have this issue. It's not as prevalent. New Zealand is the same. Pretty much Europe is quite secular. And yeah. they, they don't care. Scandinavia is even almost atheistic. The most society. secular place in the world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and then you go to the United States. And considering the beginning, the founding fathers, mostly deists and probably non-theists. Yes. And the most secular constitution in the world trying to... Um, uh, say well, God and, and and things like that. You know, while we respect them, they don't have, they don't have a place in in our policies to to emerge and, and end up being a, in a situation where the U.S. is perceived to be almost have elements of very religious um, uh, appetite. Fascistic, yeah. It's uh... Uh, well. How do you explain that from from the beginning? It should have emerged into. The, the the banner of, of of all secularism and the separation of, of church and state but we still see it quite prevalently in the u.s i mean i really don't know it's a very good question and i don't know that anyone has answered it adequately perhaps some historians have i mean i don't know if there's something about the very tumultuous way in which the american population grew as Im mixtures of immigrants from all of these places and very recently there's no antiquity uh, oh i mean i guess australia also is not doesn't yeah. have antiquity so i mean i just don't know i i i it's a it's a great question and i can't answer it but it's enormously problematic uh yeah yeah do you, do you think it's um uh... Maybe the, the, there's the, the, the two political parties in the U.S. and one is that the ultra-conservative, the right wing, uh, which doesn't necessarily need to be uh, theistic. We've, we've seen right wings um, uh, movements in the U.S. now that are the uh, atheists, but they're conservative, so they don't have to be sure. uh, found together. But could that be a connection? And the, 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 there are lots of older generations are afraid of losing their way. But I, I think that I think that that's a response, right? When you have an ultra conservative party that is trying to control a people and and give, and propagandize them, they're responding to what is going to work the best. And they found that being very Jesusy, uh, right, being presenting very religious narrative is what works the best to polarize them and brainwash them. Um, so it's not that they it's not that people are reacting to religious propaganda. It's that religious propaganda is crafted because it works on the population. So we still come back to this thing of why is America so religious? I just don't know. I can't tell you. I live in California, so I don't I don't run into it. I don't. Yeah, <laughs> I, yeah. I'm in this happy little bubble of, you know, everywhere. I mean, obviously, religious people exist, but it's like yeah. I'm not running running up against it every day here. Something to always do with the South, the South of each of the countries, you know, like the South of Australia has this problem. For, for some reason, the South, the Southern people are always closer to God. For, <laughs> yeah. Maybe it's not above in the sky. Maybe he's uh, in, in, in hell. You'd think in the <laughs> Southern <laughs> Hemisphere, it'd be flipped, right? And it'd be yeah. something about being closer to the equator. You know? yeah. the, the North of the North dilemma. There is no such thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I'm going to end up with um, with what from here you're going to continue obviously doing your fan a lot of people are commenting how you how much you've helped them um with their uh with chemistry with a lot of of your classes fantastic capsules of focus and concentrated material you've helped so many people over the years where from here where do you want to go are you going to start uh, uh, doing the educational stuff as well as debunking of pseudo scientists and charlatans yeah, all, everything. I mean, my the primary goal of the channel has always been and will continue to be to create academically aligned or, or curriculum aligned academic tutorials. Uh, so I'm working on about a dozen topics now and will continue to, to put out those uh, tutorials. Um, but yeah, obviously debunking has become, I mean, I've just over the past three years or so that I've been doing it, I feel like I've been getting better and I, I feel definitely a calling for it. I feel that I'm uniquely suited for it. I feel I have a talent for it um, and uh, have the temperament for it. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, to be in it's that important. debate and, and remain calm was, you know, 
uh, was challenging, but uh, I was able to do it. Uh, so I would like to continue doing more of this kind of stuff. And, and honestly, I, it, like James is such an volatile, he's such a volatile character uh, that for me to have performed the way I did in that, I feel like any of the Discovery Institute clowns, it just would be a walk in the park compared to James. I mean, you'd think that like against Meyer or any of these guys, oh. like they just, it would be an annihilation. And I'm pretty sure they know that. And none of them would ever dare try uh, sadly, uh, because that would be a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, I'd like to do, I'd like to do more debates. And uh, of course I'm not going to stop. I mean, I have at least four more guys in the DI that I got to, uh, that I have to expose and humiliate because I'm having too much fun. And these guys are so stupid. Like you just, if, if they, if they would just leave it well enough alone, you know what I mean? Like if James, if I just made that 45 minute video and James just ignored it, probably nothing else would have happened. But he just made that series, and so I crushed the series. He made another series, and I crushed that series. And it's the same with these guys from the DI. All they're doing is pissing me off by making all this damage control propaganda, like character assassinations on me. All you're doing is strengthening my resolve, and I'm going to annihilate even more of you. I'm just going to go through every single one on the roster or, and or just humiliate be, them. They could be a little bit smart for a short-term game because they obviously you, you've got over 2 million people um, uh, following you you're in your channel, and um, they're like almost like a, a you know a, a whimper you know and they go yeah. okay well this guy is quite famous he's quite known are we gonna rub shoulders with him so we can just ride even you know yeah, people might disagree but we might get a lot of people who are you know um dogmatically inclined to believe in, in, in a creator and therefore we get a bit of a, a free um, advertisement mm -hmm. Yeah, but also they're getting famous for being unbelievably, char un you know, idiotic charlatans. I mean, I really make them look really stupid. Uh, whereas before, if it like if you don't have my content as a guide through their lies, then they can they give off the appearance of being knowledgeable. Right. And that's their whole shtick. Like I have a Ph.D. in a completely unrelated field and I'm wearing a suit. So and I speak eloquently. So I must be right. And religious people fall for it. Um mm -hmm. But uh, then I have my content and like, you know, if you search Michael Behe or Casey Luskin, like it's the top result. <laughs> this is my video humiliating them. So there that's yeah, I'm, I'm definitely very under their skin. They're really real. Like they can't stop. I can see it on Twitter. I know. I can see it on Twitter. They're it's obsessed. It's really <laughs> funny. It's really funny. <laughs> the, the basically, every second tweet from them is about you. <laughs> These guys, like, and it's not just the Discovery Institute, but each of the senior members will yeah. tweet it out. And they'll tweet the same thing three times. The same right. thing. Just and it, it's just like, oh, maybe Dave won't catch this one. And but I catch them and I and I'll and I'll dunk on them. And then people will like my comment like quadruple as many times as the post. So it's well, just like three, this times is quite, beautiful. three times quite deliberate. It's, it's reference to the triune gods. <laughs> oh, I see. Yeah, everything's the trinity of these people. <laughs> uh dave uh, i'm very appreciative of everything you do I've, I've learned a lot from you over the years uh you are one of my favorite guests when it comes to chemistry and bi biology and, and, and when, whenever we chat your your calm demeanor uh is something that we are going to be i mean this is a legacy what you're having in your channel uh what, 20 years from now you're going to look back and you're going to be very proud of what you've achieved cool i hope so yeah <laughs> yeah i'm well, proud now so Hopefully yeah, and I, and I think the the, the 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 fact that you are, uh, and I think the the conversations you're having debunking Charleston is becoming very very important because there's a, a lot of people who are not um, science educators and they go to church, yeah, uh, and and it's very very important. I said we are going to be facing so many challenges in the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years, and we have the the, the vast uh, majority of the world's population have no idea how the world works. Mm -hmm. it's going to, be, going to be an issue yeah the and the divide is only increasing right you know wh what we've learned in every area of science and then also the way tech is progressing it's uh it's sometimes a little bit uh, uh you know disheartening to think about exactly how few people understand any of anything that that we know as a species you know so yeah <laughs> Uh, one more time, thank you so much for all you, what, what you do, you're doing so far and what are you going to continue to do. I look forward to more chats in the future. But until then, uh, just be the great person you are. Thank you thanks so much. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks thank for having you. me. 
All right. Thanks, folks. Next week, we are going to be having Dr. Michael Shermer and Dan Barker talking about the emergence of uh, consciousness and morality. Uh, did God do it or uh, it's nothing but natural selection? Thanks for watching. We'll catch you later.